Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Manns and I'd like to welcome you to the April 4th Coalition Show. This is the November 7th, 2022 edition of the show and it has been 427 weeks since the closing of the North Adams Regional Hospital. The April 4th Coalition's mission statement is, we are for workers' rights and collective bargaining rights and are against tax breaks for the rich and corporations who ship our jobs overseas. We support all the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but as is the custom, we put the emphasis on Article 23, and I presume Dick would like to do one and two again. Sure. Number one, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and protection against unemployment. Number two, everyone, without any discrimination, has the right to equal pay for equal work. Number three, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, remuneration or compensation, ensuring for himself or herself and his or her family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Number four, everyone has the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of her or his interests. And lastly, we always give a thank you to the radio station program director, Michael Putnam, WMNLB 107.1, for airing the audio portion of our show. Normally, he does this at first on Fridays at 6 p.m. And, of course, to David Fabiano for helping us produce this show. Dick, today's November 7th. Is tomorrow yes. an important day? Yes. Tomorrow, for those that haven't voted early... I think we both have voted early. We have both I voted handed early. in my ballot last week, but it's time, it's the deadline tomorrow, it's time to get out and vote. So um, we have a lot of candidates on the ballot locally. Uh, we have a, a contested race for state senate, yes, Paul, Mark. Paul Mark. He's a, he's a labor person. He's gotten endorsed by the AFL-CIO and so has our, our uh, state rep who's unopposed, sure. John Barrett. Barrett. And then the AFL-CIO has endorsed uh, Healy Driscoll for governor and lieutenant governor, governor. and then Andrea Campbell uh, for attorney general, and then Diana DiZaglio, state auditor, and Bill Gavin for secretary of state, and Deborah Goldberg uh, as treasurer. This might be the first time the Berkshire Eagle actually endorsed everybody that the AFL-CIO yeah. endorsed, because I was reading that last weekend, and they, they, they came out and they predicted that probably in Massachusetts all these people would win and that Paul Mark would probably take the state Senate seat. They felt it was only fair for him to get it because since his particular district for in the state, represent, state House of Representatives was the one that got disbanded, I guess, yeah. or expanded to another one. In, so, and the AFL-CIO endorsed a voting yes on question one, along with the Berkshire Eagle, Eagle. and yes on question four, along, along with, with the, the Berkshire, Berkshire Eagle. Eagle. And uh, the Berkshire Eagle said vote yes on all three. Yeah, actually uh, all four. All four, I mean, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, I don't think the AFL-CIO said any, made a statement on two and three. Right. So. We'll, we'll, we'll pass on that. That's what the editors at the Berkshire Eagle. And, and I realize Massachusetts... I don't think has a U.S. Senate candidate no. on the bell. I think this is the two-year mark where we don't. They'll be up in the next two elections, yeah. but not this one. But, but uh, there's a national election going on yes. that we want to help you. And it's very important. And uh, first of all, I want to show a, a, a campaign speech that Barack Obama uh, gave in Wisconsin, um, blasting the senator from Wisconsin who said that we should cut Social Security and no, actually, he said we should fund it every year, and if we don't right. fund it, it should go away. Yeah, right. Social Security and Medicare should should be every year should be on the it part of the budget, and you know how that works. Yep. And uh, but anyways, let's let's listen to this fiery speech by uh, Barack Obama. If you understand 
understands giving tax breaks for private planes more than he understands making sure that seniors who've worked all their lives are able to retire with dignity and respect. He's not the person who's thinking about you and knows you and sees you, and he should not be your senator from Wisconsin. Yes. I always you. love to see... Uh, you only missed a little snippet of that, the part yeah. where he was talking about your parents and grandparents working. Yes. You know, on their knees and calloused hands and earning their Social Security benefits. That it, it's not a giveaway. That it's not a giveaway. Yeah. So, uh, and he's not the only senator. The Republican National Committee, a, a senator, senatorial committee, even came out and said that's what they're planning to do is that that right they, if they, they if they get control of both houses yeah and they even they talked about go. holding the the uh the debt ceiling limit hostage if Next they year. don't get cuts in social security Correct. and, and that they're planning to do hoping yeah. to do that in 2023 yeah. folks but that was a very fiery campaign speech and uh it, it's a big election in wisconsin there's big elections all over the place but it's really important here in massachusetts I would like to see our first woman governor. It would we, be nice. we, we, we met with Mara Healy when she was attorney general. Yes, we, we did many years ago. Yeah, she came and met with us at the college and talked to us about reopening, about our, our stance on reopening the hospital. We, I held this book up. I had this book with me on tyranny. And she go, oh, that's a good book. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's got a chapter in there about preserving our institutions. Right. And talking about preserving institutions, I don't know if you got to see it, but uh, President no, Biden no, gave, a, that one. Gave, a, gave a speech, and it's fairly long, but we're going to try to give as much of it as we can fit in, and um, it'll show you, and he's talking about preserving our institutions of democracy. People say we have to save democracy. I'd like to go a step further. What we have to do after this election is expand democracy. Correct. So a, a democracy comes part of your everyday life, in the workplace, everywhere. Where? Let's At expand home. democracy. But anyways, let's hear what uh, President Biden had to say. Good evening, everyone. Just a few days ago, a little before 2.30 a.m. in the morning, a man smashed the back windows and broke into the home of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the third highest ranking official in America. He carried in his backpack zip ties, duct tape, rope, and a hammer. As he told the police, he had come looking for Nancy Pelosi to take her hostage, to interrogate her, to threaten to break her kneecaps. But she wasn't there. Her husband, my friend Paul Pelosi, was home alone. The assailant tried to take Paul hostage. He woke him up. He wanted to tie him up. The assailant ended up using a hammer to smash Paul's skull. Thankfully, by the grace of God, Paul survived. All this happened after the assault. And it just, I, it's hard to even say. It's hard to even say. After the assailant entered the home asking, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Those are the very same words used by the Mind States Capitol on January the 6th when they broke windows, kicked in the doors, brutally attacked law enforcement, roamed the corridors hunting for officials, and erected gallows to hang the former vice president, Mike Pence. It was an enraged mob that had been whipped up into a frenzy by a president repeating over and over again the big lie that the election of 2020 had been stolen. It's a lie that fueled the dangerous rise in political violence and voter intimidation over the past two years. Even before January the 6th, we saw election officials and election workers in a number of states subject to menacing calls, physical threats, even threats to their very lives. In Georgia, for example, the Republican Secretary of State and his family were subjected to death threats because he refused to break the law and give in to the defeated president's demand, just find him 11,780 votes. Just find me 11,780 votes. Election workers like Shea Moss and her mother, Ruby Freeman, were harassed and threatened 
just because they had the courage to do their job and stand up for the truth, to stand up for our democracy. This institution, this intimidation, this violence against Democrats, Republicans, and nonpartisan officials just doing their jobs are the consequence of lies told for power and profit, lies of conspiracy and malice, lies repeated over and over to generate a cycle of anger, hate, vitriol, and even violence. In this moment, we have to confront those lies with the truth. The very future of our nation depends on it. My fellow Americans, we're facing a defining moment, an inflection point. We must, with one overwhelming, unified voice, speak as a country and say there's no place, no place for voter intimidation or political violence in America, whether it's directed at Democrats or Republicans. No place, period. No place ever. I speak today near Capitol Hill, near the U.S. Capitol, the citadel of our democracy. I know there's a lot at stake in these midterm elections, from our economy, to the safety of our streets, to our personal freedoms, the future of health care, Social Security, Medicare. It's all important. But we'll have our differences. We'll have our difference of opinion. And that's what it's supposed to be. But there's something else at stake. Democracy itself. I'm not the only one who sees it. Recent polls have shown that overwhelming majority of Americans believe our democracy at ri is at risk, that our democracy is under threat. They, too, see that democracy is on the ballot this year, and they're deeply concerned about it. So today, I appeal to all Americans, regardless of party, to meet this moment of national and generational importance. We must vote, knowing what's at stake and not just the policy of the moment, but institutions that have held us together as we sought a more perfect union are also at stake. We must vote knowing who we have been, what we're at risk of becoming. Look, my fellow Americans, the old expression, freedom is not free. It requires constant vigilance. From the very beginning, nothing has been guaranteed about democracy in America. Every generation has had to defend it, protect it, preserve it, choose it. For that's what democracy is. It's a choice, a decision of the people, by the people, and for the people. The issue couldn't be clear, in my view. We, the people, must decide whether we'll have fair and free elections, and every vote counts. We, the people, must decide whether we're going to sustain a republic where reality is accepted, the law is obeyed, and your vote is truly sacred. We, the people, must decide whether the rule of law will prevail whether we will allow the dark forces to thirst, that thirst for power, put ahead of the principles that we've long guided us. You know, American democracy is under attack because the defeated former president of the United States refuses to accept the results of the 2020 election. He refuses to accept the will of the people. He refuses to accept the fact that he lost he has abused his power and put the loyalty to himself before loyalty to the Constitution. And he's made a big lie, an article of faith in the MAGA Republican Party, the minority of that party. The great irony about the 220 election is that it's the most attacked election in our history. And yet, and yet, there's no election in our history that we can be more certain of its results. Every legal challenge that could have been brought was brought. Every recount that could have been undertaken was undertaken. Every recount confirmed the results. Wherever fact or evidence had been demanded, the big lie has been proven to be just that, 
a big lie every single time. Yet now, extreme MAGA Republicans aim to question not only the legitimacy of past elections, but elections being held now and into the future. The extreme MAGA element of the Republican Party, which is a minority of that party, as I said earlier, but is this driving force, is trying to succeed where they failed in 2020, to suppress the right of voters and subvert the electoral system itself. That means denying your right to vote and deciding whether your vote even counts. Instead of waiting until an election is over, they're starting well before it. They're starting now. They've emboldened violence and intimidation of voters and election officials. It's estimated that there are more than fires on the ballot all across America this year. We can't ignore the impact this is having on our country. It's damaging, it's corrosive, and it's destructive. And I want to be very clear, this is not about me. It's about all of us. It's about what makes America, America. It's about the durability of our democracy. For democracies are more than a form of government. They're a way of being, a way of seeing the world, a way that defines who we are, what we believe, why we do what we do. Democracy is simply that fundamental. We must, in this moment, dig deep within ourselves and recognize that we can't take democracy for granted any longer. With democracy on the ballot, we have to remember these first principles. Democracy means the rule of the people, not the rule of monarchs or the moneyed, but the rule of the people. Autocracy is the opposite of democracy. It means the rule of one, one person, one interest, one ideology, one party. To state the obvious, the lives of billions of people from antiquity till now have been shaped by the battle between these competing forces, between the aspirations of the many and the greed and power of the few, between the people's right for self-determination and the self-seeking autocrat, between the dreams of a democracy and the appetites of an autocracy. What we're doing now is going to determine whether democracy will long endure. It, in my view, is the biggest of questions. Whether the American system that prizes the individual bends towards justice and depends, depends on the rule of law, whether that system will prevail. This is the struggle we're now in, a struggle for democracy, a struggle for decency and dignity, a struggle for prosperity and progress, a struggle for the very soul of America itself. Make no mistake, Democracy is in the ballot for all of us. We must remember that democracy is a covenant. We need to start looking out for each other again, seeing ourselves as we the people, not as entrenched enemies. This is a choice we can make. Disunion and chaos are not inevitable. There's been anger before in America. There's been division before in America, but we've never given up on the American experiment. We can't do that now. The remarkable thing about American democracy is this. Just enough of us, on just enough occasions, have chosen not to dismantle democracy, but to preserve democracy. We must choose that path again. Because democracy is in the ballot, we have to remember that even in our darkest moments, there are fundamental values and beliefs that unite us as Americans, and they must unite us now. What are they? Well, I think first, we believe the vote in America is sacred, to be honored, not denied, respected, not dismissed, counted, not ignored. A vote is not a partisan tool 
be counted when it helps your candidates and tossed aside when it doesn't. Second, we must, with an overwhelming voice, stand against political violence and voter intimidation, period. Stand up and speak against it. We don't settle our differences in America with a riot, a mob, or a bullet, or a hammer. We settle them peaceably at the battle, at the battle box, the ballot box. We have to be honest with ourselves, though. We have to face this problem. We can't turn away from it. We can't pretend it's just going to solve itself. There's an alarming rise in the number of our people in this country condoning political violence or simply remaining silent because silence is complicity. The disturbing rise of voter intimidation, the pernicious tendency to excuse political violence or at least, at least trying to explain it away. We can't allow this sentiment to grow. We must confront it head on now. It has to stop now. I believe the voices excusing or calling for violence and intimidation are a distinct minority in America. But they're loud and they are determined. We have to be more determined. All of us who reject political violence and voter intimidation and I believe that's the overwhelming majority of the American people. All of us must unite to make it absolutely clear that violence and intimidation have no place in America. And third, we believe in democracy. That's who we are as Americans. I know it isn't easy. Democracy is imperfect. It always has been. We are all called to defend it now, now. History and common sense tell us that liberty, <clears throat> opportunity, and justice thrive in a democracy, not in an autocracy. At our best, America is not a zero-sum society where for you to succeed, someone else has to fail. A promise America is big enough. It's big enough for everyone to succeed. Every generation opened in the door of opportunity just a little bit wider. Every generation, including those who have been excluded before. We believe we should leave no one behind because each one of us is a child of God. And every person, every person is sacred. If that's true, then every person's rights must be sacred as well. Individual dignity individual worth, individual determination. That's America. That's democracy. And that's what we have to defend. Look, even as I speak here tonight, 27 million people have already cast their ballot in the midterm elections. Millions more will cast their ballots in the final days leading up to November the 9th, 8th, excuse me. And for the first time, this is the first time since the national election of 2020. Once again, we're seeing record turnout all over the country. And that's good. We want Americans to vote. We want every American's voice to be heard. Now we have to move the process forward. We know that more and more ballots are cast in early voting or by mail in America. And we know that many states don't start counting those ballots until after the polls close on November 8th. That means in some cases we won't know the winner of the election for a few days until a few days after the election. It takes time to count all legitimate ballots in a legal and orderly manner. It's always been important for citizens in democracy to be informed and engaged. Now it's important for citizens to be patient as well. That's how it's supposed to work. This is also the first election since the events of January 6th, when the armed and angry mob stormed the U.S. Capitol. I wish, I wish I could say the assault on a democracy had ended that day, but I cannot. As I stand here today, there are candidates running for every level of office in America, for governor, Congress, attorney general, secretary of state, who won't commit 
They will not commit to accepting the results of election that they're running in. This is a path to chaos in America. It's unprecedented. It's unlawful. And it's un-American. As I've said before, you can't love your country only when you win. This is no ordinary year. So I ask you to think long and hard about the moment we're in. In a typical year, we're often not faced with questions of whether the vote we cast will preserve democracy or put us at risk. But this year we are. This year, I hope you'll make the future of our democracy an important part of your decision to vote and how you vote. I hope you'll ask a simple question of each candidate you might vote for. Will that person accept the legitimate will of the American people, of the people voting in his district or her district? Will that person accept the outcome of the election, win or lose? The answer to that question is vital. And in my opinion, it should be decisive. And the answer to that question hangs the future of the country we love so much and the fate of the democracy that has made so much possible for us. Too many people have sacrificed too much for too many years for us to walk away from the American project and democracy. Because we've enjoyed our freedoms for so long, it's easy to think they'll always be with us no matter what. But that isn't true today. In our bones, we know democracy at risk is at risk. But we also know this. It's within our power, each and every one of us, to preserve our democracy. And I believe we will. I think I know this country. I know we will. You have the power. It's your choice. It's your decision. The fate of the nation, the fate of the soul of America lies where it always does, with the people in your hands, in your heart, in your ballot. My fellow Americans, we'll meet this moment. We just need to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. There's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops. May God bless those standing guard over our democracy. Thank you. And Godspeed. Sorry I missed it. It would have been nice to hear it live. Um, he did reference our veterans and who will do guard and defend our freedoms. And Veterans Day is coming up on Friday, November 11th. So it's a jam-packed week this week. <laughs> yeah. but, as far as remembering democracy in America and patriotism, because the willingness to lay down your life is the truest test of patriotism. And we had a whole generation who went to war against fascism, and now we find it knocking at our door. Yep. Let's get out there and, and do the right thing. Have a good day. Power to the people. Cheese.